Hey there, my name is Jeremy Burke Miller, and today we'll be talking about a toy line that gave America its most patriotic Saturday morning cartoon, G.I. Joe 1983. Who would have thought that a military-themed toy line by Hasbro would end up fostering G.I. Joe into such a popular culture phenomenon? To begin with, we've had a Larry Hama's G.I. Joe, a real American hero, a smash hit comic book series boasting 155 issues and leading the way for a whole new generation of comic book readers. This was followed by the celebrated Ron Friedman developing a miniseries, one that permanently altered the toy industry and at the same time gave America its most patriotic Sunday morning cartoon. Yo, Joe! In today's video, we will be exploring the 1983 cartoon that defined the era and generated a total of 95 action-packed episodes. You better be ready for this one. But before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. What the cartoon television series is all about. Before we go into the details of the popular cartoon TV series, it is important for you to be aware of a few things first. Back in the summer of 1982, when Hasbro relaunched the toy line, reintroducing the initial 12-inch action figures to a 3.75-inch, cartoons were modulated to a great extent by the Federal Communications Commission. The reason was pretty simple. FCC just did not want any company advertising their merchandise to children. But surprisingly, cartoons were allowed to be based on comic books and characters. No wonder, President Ronald Reagan came along as a huge blessing and FCC finally gave a green signal to the toy companies for their half-hour commercials. Full credits to the recognition of these commercials which actually led the way for the G.I. Joe cartoon series. Co-produced by Sunbow Productions and Marvel Productions, the cartoon television series ran in syndication beginning with their first animated miniseries, G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero, which for most fans is the mass device. The plot of this miniseries was kept pretty simple. The events revolved around the device, one that happened to be a high-powered matter transporter. Now throw in the G.I. Joes and the Cobras, both teams traveling all around the world to lay their hands on these three catalytic components required to charge up the device. This was followed by G.I. Joe, The Revenge of Cobra. After the five-part miniseries by Friedman having on display a similar plotline to the previous miniseries. This also had the G.I. Joes and the Cobras traversing the world to retrieve the dispersed pieces of Cobra's latest weather-controlling weapon, otherwise known as the Weather Dominator. With my new invention, the Weather Dominator, I shall destroy G.I. Joe. Next, the cartoon was developed into a regular series in the year 1985, initially beginning with Friedman's third five-part story, The Pyramid of Darkness. The storyline exhibited the majority of the previous cast from the existing miniseries, confined by Cobra, and also introduced a new range of characters. Please note that we are hinting at the new 1985 collection of toys to foil Cobra's commander's plans of depraving the world of electricity. Proton beam is up to speed. Lock on coordinates. Fire! The remaining 50 episodes of the first season, developed by Steve Gerber, were mostly separate single episodes with the occasional two-parters thrown in between. This was followed by a second season boasting 30 more episodes, out of which the first five episodes made up Friedman's fourth five-part adventure. Arise, Serpentor, arise. As per the storyline, the nefarious Dr. Mindbender gets inspired by a reoccurring strange dream and ends up making use of the DNA of history's greatest and most ruthless conquerors in order to genetically create the newest Cobra Emperor. <laughs> The second season also pointed towards the new 1986 collection of toys, and was developed by Buzz Dixon. The cartoon series wound up with Don Jerwich's 1987 direct-to-video animated flick, G.I. Joe the Movie, one that aired in syndication as a featured-length movie as well as a five-part miniseries. Now that we're clear with the basics, let's talk about G.I. Joe. Mind you, the name does not refer to any particular individual. In fact, it points towards the cream of the crop commandos who goes without saying, are exceedingly well-trained. Their goal is quite simple. They believe in democracy and they wish to protect the system from the wicked Cobra organization. 
who, for obvious reasons, is obsessed with world domination. The plotline of the cartoon series is uncomplicated, with one team attacking, the other team has to shield themselves, and that's how it works between the Joes and the Cobras. <laughs> Mind you, the villains will go to every extent to achieve the target of their Cobra Commander, and it's always up to the G.I. Joe team to thwart his plans. Categorically, it is the fighting sequence that is the high point of every episode. Add to that the combat locations and a horde of high-tech weapons they possess, and you have a well-rounded action-packed end result. Who are the main characters of the show? General Hawk. Ed Gilbert happens to be the voice artist of the character, who first made an appearance in the season 2 premiere episode Arise Serpentor Arise Part 1, where he is specifically put in place to take command of the G.I. Joe team. Part of his job requires him to have Sergeant Slaughter retrain the whole team after a rather embarrassing encounter with the Cobra forces. Wait a minute, Slaughter. The Joes have gotten careless and sloppy. Why don't you stick around and train them? While the animated series has no elucidation as to how Hawk actually became the commander of the team, it was in the episode titled Not a Ghost of a Chance, where it's actually disclosed that Hawk was the original field commander of the team. Duke. Well, there happens to be a Joe version of Captain America. We are stressing good looks, blue eyes, a leader by intuition, and someone who believes that a commander should be with his troops and not behind the battle lines. Say hello to Duke. Voiced by Michael Bell, the first sergeant of the G.I. Joe team makes his debut cartoon appearance in the episode titled The Cobra Strikes, and is generally the one to scream, Yo Joe! while leading his squad into battle. There's no doubt in the fact that he is a daunting combatant, but despite that, he is often the one to get repeatedly captured. Flint. If Duke is addressed as the man of action, Flint here is a strategist as well as a meticulous planner. Voiced by Bill Ratner, he first appeared in the second G.I. Joe miniseries titled The Revenge of Cobra Part 1, In the Cobra's Pit. Here, he is portrayed as the second-in-command, substituting for Duke as the team leader after the former gets captured by Cobra. It goes without saying that his character keeps reappearing throughout the whole series, and it is his romantic angle with Lady J, which happens to be the most common thread that the comic book had with the cartoon series. Beachhead. Now here's a character who's very vocal about things. Mind you, he's inevitably going to be blunt about his opinions and honestly doesn't care, even if it is General Hawk, Duke, or Flint that he has to face for that matter. Voiced by William Calloway, he is seen serving as fourth in the G.I. Joe leadership, and is also at times seen sharing his command with Sergeant Slaughter. The cartoon series has him short-tempered, very sturgent when it comes to the rules, or like married to the job to be honest, and then there's his intense disapproval, especially towards romantic relationships. Relationships. Sergeant Slaughter. Often addressed as the toughest of all the Joes, Sergeant Slaughter's trademark look is incomplete without his mirrored sunglasses and his signature drill instructor's campaign hat. Voiced by Bob Remus, the character who is based on the professional wrestler himself first made an appearance in the second season of the series titled Arise Serpenter Arise Part 1. Sergeant Slaughter is exceptionally strong and you can throw him in the toughest of situations only to see him effortlessly take care of himself. Portrayed as a special drill instructor, he's often seen conducting his own boot camp, which is known as the Slaughterhouse. And when the man gives you orders, you abide by them. Cobra Commander. Say hello to the arch nemesis of the G.I. Joes and the ultimate leader of the ruthless terrorist organization, Cobra. One that is obsessed with world domination. Boasting a face that is always covered, the mysterious masked man voiced by Chris Lotta has a penchant for rustling up the most devious schemes all aimed towards ruling the world and declaring triumph over the Joes. For instance, there was a time when he joined hands with Dr. Mindbender and literally went to the extent of creating a new leader, one that would take his place. The fact that he is an evil genius shows that when he reprogrammed a whole unit of bats just so as to take care of Serpenter as well as Sergeant Slaughter and all it took him was just a handful of minutes. <laughs> the character is also famous for shouting retreat the minute something goes awry and is more than often seen putting the blame for his blunders on others. Destro. Let's get one thing straight about this guy here. 
He's moody. He is ready to work as Cobra Commander's right-hand man, as well as go against the whole organization, and in both these cases, he usually depends on what suits him the most. It is fair to say that his relationship with the Cobra Commander is quite derisive. We are particularly laying stress on the times when Destro has gone to the extent of beating him. It is a different thing that the Cobra Commander has always disregarded his attempts because, to be honest here, Destro being the weapons manufacturer and supplier happens to be the only one to know how to make the Doomsday devices function, given that he is the creator. Remember us mentioning the Weather Dominator earlier in the video? Well, this weather controlling weapon here happens to be his creation. Voiced by Arthur Burghardt, the character's origin was disclosed in the episode titled Skeletons in the Closet, which also shed light on the fact that he was distantly related to Lady Jane, the Baroness. Portrayed as Cobra's intelligence officer as well as infiltration specialist, the Baroness first appeared in the miniseries episode titled The Mass Device Part 1, The Cobra Strikes. Voiced by Morgan Lofting, the character happens to be a mistress of disguise. Well, what else are you supposed to call someone whose impersonation skills have made her masquerade as tourists, doctors, high-ranking officers, and even as a cameraman and a film crew? Her romantic angle with Destro is pretty much out in the open, and for a girlfriend, she's quite clingy and vengeful. After all, who in her sane mind would end up causing the destruction of her boyfriend's ancestral castle as payback? Tomax and Zamot. Also known as the Crimson Twins, the brothers were first introduced in the miniseries The Pyramid of Darkness. As the heads of extensive enterprises, which happens to be one of the biggest financial backers of Cobra, the duo also serves as the organization's Crimson Guard commanders. The fact that these thrill seekers here have a deep psychological connection with each other also makes them vulnerable, something that the Joes are seen taking full advantage of. In simple words, you hit Tomax and Zamot ends up feeling the same pain too. <laughs> Also, when the twins are separated, they can track each other down. While Tomax is voiced by Corey Burton, Zamot, who has a nasty scar on his face, is played by Michael Bell. Serpentor, meeting the main antagonist of the second season, a creation of Dr. Mindbender. For those who are not aware, and we highly doubt if there happens to be any, Serpentor was conceived as the ideal warrior, someone who was extricated from the DNA of the world's greatest military minds. Voiced by Dick Gautier, it is still hard to disregard the overweening madcap leader's most famous dialogue, This I command. To this very day, Sergeant Slaughter is mine. This I command. While there's no denying that his character is a physical powerhouse and is more than ready to lead from the front lines, the fact that he is exceedingly impulsive as well as foolish shows when he leads Cobra into a full-scale attack on Washington, D.C. How on earth is seizing control of one city adequate enough to have the whole country given to submission? Well, we'll leave that to Serpentor. What is happening? How good was the toy line? It all began with American inventor and licensing agent Stan Weston initiating a discussion with Hasbro regarding a 12-inch military toy concept for boys back in the early 1960s. He was turned down only to be approached by the head of research and development of the toy company, Don Levine, who eventually bought the rights to his invention. It's fair to say that the G.I. Joe had a green signal waved, but of course, the toy was in need of a name and suitable selling campaign. And most importantly, an action figure. Hasbro generated many figures, each different from the other, and it goes without saying that the toy line was a hit. However, following the Vietnam War and the 1973 oil crisis, the toy line suffered a massive blow, eventually going into retirement in the year of 1978. It was Bob Prupis, the senior vice president of international marketing, who believed in the series and knew where Job truly belonged, back on the shelves of the stores. To begin with, he sized down Joe to 3.75 inches and gave them 10 points of articulation. But for the new version to succeed, they were in definite need of something more to lure in kids and not just additional joints. The easiest way to do that would be through commercials. More like 30 second cartoons of the reimagined Joes and their exciting storylines. Nobody beats G.I. Joe! Yo Joe! But with the Federal Communications Commission and their number of regulations for a toy commercial, it dawned upon Hasbro that G.I. Joe had to have its own comic book storyline. With Larry Hama taking over the comic book series, 30 second animated commercials were also created to make way for the comic book. But with Joe having new cartoons, it was essential for him to have an enemy. 
A meeting was set between Archie Goodwin, the Marvel editor, and Hasbro, resulting in the birth of Cobra. The upgraded series was finally initially introduced in 1983 with each figure re-releasing with a new feature. Hasbro didn't limit itself to just figures. They released vehicles along with the playsets. Soon, the limitation of the 30-second commercials turned into the franchise having its own cartoon as well. And we all know how that went. The popularity of the Joe toy line reached an all-new height in 1986, only to meet a sudden, unanticipated competition in the form of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. The sales started going down, but it was in 1989 that the toy line faced another massive blow, when the chairman and chief executive officer of Hasbro, Stephen D. Hassenfield, met an untimely demise. The toy line was suspended for good in the year of 1994. Yeah. Interesting facts about the cartoon. Larry Hama had initially been working on the series that he addressed as Fury Force, one that had Nick Fury Jr. as the leader of a highly classified seven-member paramilitary strike force. The series has him leading his unit to fight the terrorist organization Hydra. Sadly, this series was not picked up by Marvel. But with Hasbro approaching Marvel to work on a comic series with their revived G.I. Joe storyline, it was Hama's Fury Force, which was revised. Hydra was reworked, eventually becoming Cobra, and the rest is history. Also, would you believe us if we told you that the majority of number of vehicles that the G.I. Joe and Cobra had on display were actually based on real military machinery? The future of G.I. Joe? It should not come as a surprise to you at all when we tell you that Paramount Pictures categorically has big plans when it comes to expanding the G.I. Joe franchise. Paramount officially disclosed in May 2020 that they were in the middle of developing a Snake Eyes follow-up flick. Please note that the untitled movie will not be a sequel. Instead, it actually takes a deeper plunge into the G.I. Joe's world. The good news is Henry Golding returns as Snake Eyes. Screenwriters Joe Shrapnel and Anna Waterhouse are reported to do the screenplay and the release date, if the movie still happens to be a mystery. Next, Paramount is also reported to be busy with another untitled G.I. Joe film, one whose details have not been disclosed, but what is confirmed? Fact is that Josh Applebaum and Andre Namek are the screenwriters of the new movie. For everything else, fans of the franchise have to wait. Last but not least, the franchise is also said to be heading towards the small screen. Apparently, Hasbro and Paramount TV have collaborated with Amazon Prime Video in order to come up with a new live-action standalone G.I. Joe series revolving around the character Lady J. And no point for guessing that part will be essayed by Adrian Palicki. The series is created by Eric Olson, who will also be acting as the showrunner and the show is said to be connected to the larger G.I. Joe universe. Stay tuned with us for all upcoming information. If you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one, and be safe. Thanks, everyone. That's easy for you to say, sucker. Now shut up. <laughs>